it's Janelle Waz, and welcome back to another episode of Waz Reviews. It's another typical day for Jean-Luc and the gang. Romulans crossing the border, a station about to explode, a planet-shattering device in the wrong hands that could wreak havoc on the galaxy, Worf being denied... again? Perhaps it was a cloaked Romulan vessel. I doubt the Romulans would venture this far into Federation territory. Star Trek The Next Generation of Final Unity. Released in 1995, about seven months after the next-gen movie premiere in Star Trek Generations, A Final Unity was a point-and-click Star Trek adventure game that brought back the main cast of Star Trek The Next Generation for another adventure in the good old Enterprise-D. You know, before Troy crashed it. All hands, race for Patrick Stewart, Jonathan Frakes, LeVar Burton, Michael Dorn, Gates McFadden, Marina Sirtis, Brent Spiner, and even Majel Barrett. But sadly, not as Waxana Troy. So She's here. <laughs> yes, indeed. The story takes place during season seven of the show and plays much like a lost episode. But is this one Star Trek game to unify them all? Is it really as final as the name implies? After all, there's almost an entire season and four movies to get through for the next-gen cast. Get your replicators pumping out that tea, Earl Grey hot, as we boldly go with Star Trek The Next Generation of Final Unity. Tell them. Take us in the transport range. But before I go any further, make sure you subscribe to my channel. I talk a lot about Star Trek, video games, and whatever else I feel like talking about. Be great to have you aboard. The game opens as most next-gen episodes open, with a captain's log. Captain's log, stardate 47111.1. An unidentified vessel headed for Federation space, and the Enterprise is being sent to investigate. It turns out that it's a Garidian ship seeking asylum, and if you don't know what a Garidian is, basically Romulans without being Romulans. ROMULAN! Worf announces that they're in sensor range and... <laughs> these 3D graphics grace the cutscenes of this game. Now, the 3D models do resemble the characters, but they just look really weird and stiff. But then again, this was released the same year as DS9 Harbinger with its Play-Doh graphics. Data probably fares the best, but there's Worf's fish lips, Riker looking like a discount soap opera villain, and Picard's Cheekbones! Women would die for those cheekbones! And can we talk about those pointed chins? You can carve an entire statue with those chins! Early 90s graphics. Gotta love them. Meanwhile, a Garidian warbird decloaks and has the fleeing ship in its tractor beam. And Picard calls Red Alert before the show's intro plays in 3D rendered graphics and MIDI-style music that only a computer from the early 90s could support. While Patrick Stewart gives the familiar intro monologue. And so far, this feels like the start of an episode of Next Gen. Space. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. And this is where the game finally starts, so let's talk about gameplay really quickly. I would separate the game into three different types of gameplay. The bridge, ship battles, and away missions. The bridge is where you can plot a course to a planet, receive hails from Starfleet or planets the Enterprise is orbiting, and ask the bridge crew for advice, of which they are seldom helpful. Counselor, do you have any thoughts? I'm sorry, Captain, but I don't have any suggestions right now. Any suggestions, number one? I'm sorry, Captain, I don't have any suggestions right now. But every so often, there is a hostile ship you'll have to face in battle, and there are different settings that you can use in the tactical screen. But to be honest, I never got the hang of the space battles, and mostly left it up to Worf and whatever pre-programmed tactics were available. And admittedly, the game kept freezing up on me during these sections, so I didn't get much of a chance to understand the mechanics of space battles in this game. I just wanted to progress the story further without constantly freezing. Additionally, you'll also send pre-selected away teams to different planets, where you can control each member to walk around, look at stuff, grab or use items, and talk to people. Or even items. That will not work. 
away team members might have certain specialties for tasks that need to be done, like Jordy using his engineering expertise to fix a machine, or Dr. Crusher treating an injured person. Your away team members can also be injured, and when that happens, you'll all be beamed back to the ship for treatment. And that's basically how the game is played. We now return to the story currently in progress. Naturally, Picard decides to take the Gridian fugitives on board by breaking the tractor beam with the Enterprise itself, angering the captain of the Warbird, Captain Pentara, because blah blah blah, this is an internal Gridian matter, even though they're the ones that cross the neutral zone. Are we sure they're not really Romulans? It seems this time you are the one who has made an aggressive move across the neutral zone. We have some dialogue choices which appear throughout the game, with different tones that range from Season 3 onward Diplomatic Picard, to Season 1 The Replicator Just Ran Out of Earl Grey Picard. But I'm playing it Season 3 cool today. Surely we can resolve this matter without recourse to further violence? Uh I will use violence if you do not cooperate, Captain. Well, nice to meet you too, lady. Well, I'm just gonna throw the rule book at ya. Our Garidian guests were rescued in Federation space. Any extradition will have to proceed along normal diplomatic channels. Of course, Pintara tries to play the one of those criminals is my son card, which I'm sure Picard can sympathize with. As it turns out, the fugitives are trying to change Garidian society, which is defined by four sacred scrolls, to ensure the rights of the plebeians, which are detailed in a lost fifth scroll. Now, you would think that Picard would be all, sorry, can't help you, Prime Directive. The Prime Directive forbids us to interfere with the social order of any planet. But instead, he's all, this could be an intriguing quest. But I have to be the Picard if Picard won't be the Picard. I sympathize with your cause, but I must inform you that the Federation will not take sides in Garrid's domestic politics. But of course, all this is cut short when an emergency transmission from a research station comes in, and of course we have to help them, we're Starfleet! They've been attacked by an unknown vessel, and an experimental power core is about to breach. Well, better set course for the station. Engage. Uh, Jean-Luc, you want to take a seat, or...? No! Okay. So, let's send Riker, Beverly, Jordy, and Worf over to the station. You know, our main cast members. And we have our first rescuee! Beverly, you're the doctor. Go talk to her. There's no need for that. What, you're not gonna see if she's responsive or not? Would Dr. Pulaski approve of that? We'll see. In fact, the entire away team is more concerned about the cable and not the woman lying underneath it being crushed! She needs medical attention immediately. Well, if only we had a doctor with us! Beverly, use your med kit or something! I can't do anything for her until we get that cable out of the way. So I had Worf cut the cable, so Beverly should be able to get- I can't do anything for her until we get that cable out of the way. Damn it, Beverly! Okay, Worf? Move the cable. It is too heavy. From the guy who lifted a beam off his son by himself? Okay, Riker, you move it. We can't risk it. If the cable ships, it could crush her. She's already being crushed! Even by Crusher! I can't just let that woman suffer. We have to find a way to get her free. Then pull her out from underneath the cable! Heck, break up the cable into smaller pieces! I don't think we need to blast everything in sight. <sighs> we do not have time to tend to the wounded. All right, I guess we just leave her here. It turns out that you need to beam the power cable away before Beverly can help the poor crushed woman who is still stuck under the cable. But at least she'll give us a security code, so there's that. So we use that security code to help drive away this weird pod machine thing that attacks Jordy. Jordy's been hurt. Which is draining power from the station and masks itself with false readings. It's sending false readings to our tricorders. It's like a comma, 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 chameleon. It disguises itself perfectly. But there's another matter of the power core, namely that it's about to breach and the lead scientist refuses to jettison it. Deanna could probably change his mind, but I'm about out of patience. That's right, Deanna, put on your finest tight jumpsuit and get to work. But we don't have time to reason with this guy. There are lives at stake, so Jordy jettisons the core. 
The station may be gone, but at least we and the wounded got out alive. I think I did pretty well considering the circumstances. I'd have to say I'm a little disappointed with your performance at Merton Station, Captain. Hey, screw you, Admiral! Shall I go on? Please do. So it turns out we're tossing the Prime Directive out the airlock anyways, as Picard has agreed to help the Gridians look for the fifth scroll. Would it surprise you to learn that you have violated the Prime Directive a total of nine times since you took command of the Enterprise? I mean, it's not like we got anything better to do. So we take a trip to visit a Vulcan archaeologist, Shaynok, who's investigating an ancient Chodak outpost. Who are the Chodak? Well, you know them, Deanna. They're the guys that took the USS Nakatomi hostage in that annoying level in the Genesis game. Shaynok tells Picard that the ancient Gridians who had the Fifth Scroll managed to establish a colony in what is now Federation space. All right, kind of a wide area for search, but again, it's not like I got anything better to do. Would you be interested in finding a little lost lamb for me? Well, now that you mention it... A lamb? Admiral Redrick here has a scientist friend, Dr. Hoon Forsh, who's gone missing while cataloging local species on... Marassia. <laughs> this planet. It is far too early in this game for a mission to make me feel like this. Oh, and Jean-Luc, the Morassians have a strict matriarchal society. Males are usually treated as servants at best. Oh, great! We're angel wanting this! Is this man implying that we put a lesser value on life than you do? We arrive at Morassia, and Constable Lixie here insists that Dr. Hunforsch is probably just on an extended field trip, and there's nothing to worry about. That doesn't sound suspicious at all. We permit no weapons of any kind on the surface. Oh, now that doesn't sound suspicious either! Like, no, we need to defend ourselves, yes, even from your lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. I cannot risk the safety of my away team. A typically stubborn male. Uh, excuse me? I'm a lady and I don't want to disarm! Like I said about Angel 1, this would be cringy if it was said about women, and it's also cringy when it's said about men. But, our options are limited. For a male, you are unusually cooperative. Oh, lady, you... Is there any better way to begin a relationship? Dang, Jean-Luc! I guess Picard is going to don the sexy outfit this time around. But no, it's Data, Deanna, Beverly, and Worf going down to the planet. Worf especially, in case he needs to fight off a bear or something. Now, why exactly do I shudder at this mission? The entire mission is basically collecting samples from the different biomes of Morassia as the away team slowly walks to each one. But even that wouldn't be so bad, except that the game barely gives you direction on what you're supposed to do. And if you're me and forget the tiniest piece of equipment from the lab, you could be sending these jellyfish data collector thingies everywhere and no way to read off them or know that you're doing something wrong. Even a simple line from Troy like, Maybe there's something we need to read that data off the data collector thingies. Would have sufficed. I backtracked so many times on this planet. Thank you for your time. Thank you for wasting it. And Constable Lixie is just so... disagreeable to deal with, even when talking to another woman. Why were you trying to hide it from me? I'm not yet a subject of the Federation. I don't have to explain my reasons to you. The whole mission is going down to investigate Dr. Hoonforsh's disappearance, and we end up doing her job for her. Basically, investigating the mysterious deaths of various species in the preserve. And it turns out, another scientist and a Ferengi smuggled in a dangerous, illegal animal that ended up draining the reserve's power, and Dr. Hoonforsh was drugged to stop her from talking. Now what took you so long to find me? Lady, you have no idea. And after a little investigating, we find out where the animals on Morassia came from. Apparently the animals which Dr. Hoon Forsh thought were from Romulan space actually came from Shoniosho Epsilon 6. You can tell Jonathan Frakes had to process that planet name for a moment. But the planet is actually called Phrygis, which is a lot easier to say. And it's completely deserted. Troy suggests sending out a friendly message to the planet to maybe encourage a response. 
which works. Eventually. But they have to think about whether or not to trust us, so... I have decided to trust you. This is Larock. He is the Chancellor of Phrygis, which has a bunch of old Chodak technology lying around the planet, and is divided into three religious groups who don't get along with each other, each with their own version of the Fifth Scroll. The real one? Hidden, and no one knows where it is. <sighs> I guess we'll have to find it. And that involves going to the different sects and performing a task for them, or giving them something. Basically, like fixing a music machine, unfreezing one of the sect leaders to get access to his stuff, and giving some lady her scepter back. All which leads to a weird platforming puzzle where you play a tune from one of these... things, and platforms appear, and you inevitably fall and get hurt. Hmm. But hey, look what we found! It looks like the scroll had a self-destruct mechanism. It must have triggered it somehow. Oops. Now, I'm going to let you all in on a piece of advice. Save, save often, and use multiple save slots in this game. Like most point-and-click adventure games, it's very easy to make a mistake, which can screw up your entire game. It turns out that I placed the wrong jewel into the door, which caused the scroll to disintegrate. Placing the other jewel, on the other hand, will allow you to collect the scroll. It's a 50-50 shot, and I can't remember for the life of me if the game provides you a hint to which jewel is the correct one. Just say before you do anything important, okay? So, okay, we got the scroll, but we're being hailed by a familiar face. Gah, Pentara! You've been assimilated. Your life, as it has been, is over. So, Pentara's rather miffed and out for revenge, and a revolution happened on Garrod because of a secret transmission made by one of the fugitives. And Picard is none too pleased that someone sent an unauthorized message. I do not tolerate that sort of behavior. You are playing games with thousands of lives and risking an interstellar incident. Freedom for my people is worth any price, Captain. Well, Picard's heard enough. You can have him, Pentara. Pentara's son convinces the other fugitives to go with her because... She is a woman of honor. She would keep her word even to you, someone she hates. I want you all to remember this moment. But of course the Romulans are up to their old games again, attacking various Federation ships and outposts, so we have some space battles to do where the Romulans won't tell us anything. Luckily, a Klingon who Worf fought with during the two-parter Redemption captured some of the Romulans and discovered that they're after a mythical ancient weapon from the Chodak that could destroy both the Federation and the Klingons. Though how he got that info... I trust that you are handling the prisoners appropriately. Of course, but several of them are still alive. So what's the deal with the Chodak? Well, they had a giant empire for a hundred thousand years before it disappeared almost overnight. Which doesn't mean a whole lot, because we're in space and overnight can mean many, many different things. They were an empire of bureaucrats, centralized on a planet called Eleanor, and had a unity device to maintain control, and that the Chodak ruins found on Phrygis was a rebel base. Since you are reluctant, to provide us with the location of the rebel base. I don't think we need to blast everything in sight. Picard gets a Chodak data key and a data crystal from Larak to help him on his quest. And what does this data reveal? That the rebels stole information from the main computer in the heart of the Empire and used it to attack the Unity device, which is capable of destroying planets. Yep, Star Wars. Nothing but Star Wars! Boldly going where George Lucas has gone before. It's like poetry, so if they rhyme. Even Picard's looking at Riker like, Really, number one? Really? We're borrowing from other sci-fi franchises now? And I had the distinct feeling that I'd read certain paragraphs before. And after sneaking into Shaynok's excavation site when he wasn't home, and using the computer to read data off the data crystal, and please make sure you take that rod with you! I can't tell you how many times I accidentally left the rod in the computer and had to repeat a whole bunch of stuff, including space battles that froze my game! The Enterprise finally arrives at Eleanor. <sighs> Again save and save often in multiple slots, and 
Make sure you leave the building and are outside with the rod before beaming back to the ship. You can thank me later. We arrive at Eleanor, and Picard, of course, insists on beaming down to the planet, much to Riker's chagrin. Oh, cluck, 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 number one. Captain, we have no idea what's down there. We can't risk it. Number one, we have no choice. And beaming down to the planet are Picard, Data, Geordi, and... Ensign Ricky? Good to see you up and about from last time, Ricky. In a new uniform. The mission is going through a factory, activating computers, deactivating sensors, blowing up ancient machines... Wait, blowing up ancient machines? Who are you? Where is your master? Well, this got somebody's attention. The Chodax. Who don't even look remotely like the Chodak in the Sega Genesis game. Consistency, Star Trek. That's all I ask. Now, it can go a couple of different ways at this point. You can admit to having a data key and the Chodak take it and blindfold the entire away team in a hostage situation, erase the location of the Unity device and reveal their evil plan to restore the Chodak Empire. You cannot tell them that you have the data key only to use it later on, or else they threaten you. And they take it away, erase the location of the Unity device and reveal their evil plan to restore the Chodak Empire. Or and this has to be timed correctly, but it'll save you a lot of headaches later on. You talk to them, they just let you stroll through their base unaccompanied to the computer, and you download the location of the Unity device onto your tricorder, before they take away the data key, delete the location of the Unity device, and reveal their evil plan to restore the Chodak Empire. Either way, the Chodak kinda just leave you here to escape on your own with perhaps the most convoluted transporter system to ever grace a Star Trek game. Because trial and error with the risk of dematerializing your fellow Starfleet officers is exactly what you want in a transporter. But luckily, we make it back to the ship in one piece. Even Ensign Ricky! And since we downloaded the location of the Unity device, we can just head on over. Now, you can apparently find the Unity device without downloading the location, but when I tried it, I ended up destroying the Enterprise. Look, it's not the first time Data's advice destroyed the ship. Heck, it's probably not even the 20th time. A dozen, a hundred. It's impossible to tell. But we're at the Unity device, and Picard, once again, insists on going with the away team. Captain, I must... I know what you're going to say, Will, but I'm not going to stay here and let those people decide the fate of the Federation for us. Jeez, when Riker ends up being denied more times than Worf. But of course, it turns out that Picard was probably the safest in the away team because he's the only one that made it through the transporter pad on the Unity device. And along with Captain Pantara and Admiral Brodnack of the Chodak, they're competing for control of the Unity device with some tests and... Yeah, this sounds a lot like the IFD in the Genesis game. Right down to a powerful device being sent into the future for Picard to compete for, and which also had a Chodak competing for control of it. I mean, now Star Trek is just borrowing from itself. Captain Pentara suggests that her and Picard work together, and... Initially, I said no because I don't trust her, but apparently I have to say yes because otherwise both Broadneck and Pentara team up against me and zap me to death. Also, a future Picard drops in casually to tell Picard not to trust either of them and also gives him an artifact that will help him in the test. Picard, are you with us? Oh, hell no. I'm not telling them what I saw. Yes, let's get on with it. So Picard and Pentara team up against Broadneck in the first test, which involves zapping each other, and Broadneck taunts the both of them. You are both weak. Membership in our empire would improve your species. I like my species the way it is. I like my species the way it is. Of course, Broadneck is outmatched, and while Pentara wants Picard to finish him, Picard is still Picard. Everyone including the Chodak, must be protected from the misuse of this power. A council representing all civilizations should be created to control the device. We need you to convince your people of that. Will you help us? The three of them agree to work together to get through the tests and out of here. Heck, Picard even uses the artifact future Picard gave him to help Pentara and Broadneck. 
Against better judgment, no doubt. Compromise isn't always a sign of weakness, Admiral. It's the basis of trust. And who can we thank for those misguided words of wisdom? Of course, the three of them stand to be judged who is worthy of the Unity device by this guy. The Unity device should be used for the good of all. What good can the Unity device do for Jean-Luc Picard? Perhaps make up for a father's disapproval, a brother's resentment. Hey, they worked that out in a mud fight! What do you know about my family? I watched the episode Family, and I watched the episode Tapestry, and I watched the battle. Well, technically it wasn't destroyed, Picard found it again. Hey, who's giving the test here? Sorry. Proceed. I know Locutus of Borg, who oversaw the destruction of 39 Federation starships and their crews. You've been talking to Cisco, haven't you? I was on the Saratoga at Wolf 359. I know a broken man ready to give Ghul Madred the secrets of the Federation's defenses. And there are so I guess we've established the judge is a Star Trek The Next Generation super fan. He probably has Judge Q's outfit in his closet somewhere. Picard acknowledges that he's failed in some places of his life, but he wouldn't change anything and he hasn't betrayed anyone willingly. Gee, it's almost like the judge didn't watch Tapestry after all. And you call yourself a super fan. But when I pulled on one of those threads, it unraveled the tapestry of my life. The judge goes on to grill Broadneck and Pentara and decides to give the Unity device to Pentara. You're a fool, Picard. And your son vouched for you. She is a woman of honor. We cannot regain honor by acting dishonorably. <laughs> he chose poorly. So Pantara is currently occupied, so it's up to Picard and Broadneck to head over to the Unity device and figure out what to do with it. Uh-oh, a Borg invasion fleet is headed towards the Federation. What? I say what do you do, Picard? Destroy the Borg or destroy the fleet? What do you do? What do you do? You know what? I don't like this test anymore. I'm going to shut it off. What are you doing, Picard? The Prime Directive of Starfleet prohibits me from interfering with the normal development of any society. Oh, now you bring up the Prime Directive! Even though you probably shouldn't have gotten involved with the Gridians in the first place, now we're going Prime Directive here! You have chosen wisely. You have chosen wisely. But unfortunately, we don't get to keep the Unity device because it's phasing in and out of time and needs to mend the fabric of existence. Or something. And it needs someone to join up with it to stabilize it. Which Broadneck volunteers for. Good, because Picard needs to finish off Season 7 of Next Gen and make some movies. The Enterprise beams a passed out Picard back on board, and Picard muses on whether the Federation would be able to create their own Unity device, and whether they would be wise enough to use it. The game ends with a very classic Star Trek ending. Helm ahead, Warp Factor 2. Engage. <laughs> That was Star Trek The Next Generation of Final Unity. And for a Star Trek game, it's solid. Is it a mind-blowing game? Probably not, but if you love Next Gen and are looking for a story that plays like a lost episode of the show, it's a good time with some nice callbacks to previous episodes. I love that they got the main cast together for this game and everyone does a pretty good job with it. I love the fact that you can go on away team missions, a feature that gets overlooked in a lot of Star Trek games. But while the story is solid and very much fits into Star Trek, it's not without its flaws. The Romulans get dropped in the middle of the story, just like with the Genesis game. Heck, there's a bunch of elements in the story that are very similar to the Genesis game. But like the Genesis game, A Final Unity delivers the Star Trek experience, with bridge operations, space battles, and away team missions. 
It's faithful to the universe it takes place in, everyone's in character, and it feels like it would fit into the show. There's not a whole bunch more you can ask of a game. Really, the only major complaint I have is the game's difficulty, which isn't unlike a lot of point-and-click adventure games from the time. I can see it being a pain when the game first came out, but with the internet and walkthroughs out there today, you could get unstuck pretty easily. And to be honest, I really only started heavily relying on walkthroughs at Eleanor's, so I played through a good chunk of the game without using a walkthrough. Though I still had some frustrated moments. Star Trek The Next Generation of Final Unity may not be a perfect Star Trek game, but it's certainly one of the better Star Trek games that, to any fan, is worthy to play. I should like to consider the situation a bit further. So what do you think? Have you played Star Trek The Next Generation of Final Unity? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Was it difficult for you or was it fairly easy? Does it deliver the Star Trek experience? And what are some of your favorite Star Trek games? Please leave comments below and discuss. As always, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Waz Reviews. If you like what you see, why not give my video a like and subscribe to my channel. Tell your friends! Until next time... You have chosen wisely.